one time we were somewhere in the jungle and put you up for the night and I had put my head up on my pack just so I wouldn't drown. Welcome to the podcast where we track down Australian war veterans, have a chat with them and hear their stories. I'm Alex Lloyd and this is Life on the Line. The single greatest sacrifice I've made is my family. There were a couple of public beheadings. In order to kill them, you've got to be a little bit angry. Not psychotic, but just angry. We could look down the Frankfurt and see it on fire. Stuff blowing up everywhere. There will be no surrender. And then they had to fight an enemy in amongst we got children. Point, right? you're, you're going to I could never often. not go back. They were my friends and they felt the trouble like the like She did say, fight. you've changed. The soldier put everything on the line to help one of our boys. Earlier this season, Angus Horden spoke with John Wells, a veteran of the Vietnam War. For today's conversation, I spoke with one of John's younger brothers, Andrew who also served in that conflict. I'm Alex Lloyd, speaking on Skype today with Andrew Wells. Andrew, thank you for coming on the podcast. No worries at all, mate. Let's touch briefly on your childhood, Andrew. Did you play sport or have any particularly interesting hobbies? Uh, I never played a lot of sport much. Uh, When I was younger days... Down on the farm, you still a bit of rabbit shooting and a bit of trapping and things like that. But I was never much into sport. You had quite a large number of brothers. Eight altogether. That's including stepbrothers. Yeah, eight of us, eight boys at home, nine boys at home at one stage. And where do you fit in the order of that? There are three younger than me, so I'm just about 15 in the line or something. Being on the farm, was it like a working farm experience for you? You were helping out on the land with chores and that kind of thing? or? Oh. Well, we all had to do our chores, but back then it was school days. had to be home by 5 o'clock to fill the wood box and all that. That was primary school days. And then um, I think I was about eight years old or something when my dad died. So I had to sell the farm, so then we moved into uh, into town then. And how was that transition for you, going from being so rural to being a bit more surrounded by people? Well, I think we were all a little bit wild there for a while, you know, like walking along people's fences and all that sort of thing. But uh, the one thing I remember about coming to town was having to drink pasteurised milk. I couldn't stand it. <laughs> when you were growing up, did you have any interest in the military or you know military history, anything like that? No, not at all. Not at all. And I had some great uncles or something that were away in the, in the First War, I think, but I didn't know anything about them. I had no interest at all. So how old were you when the Vietnam War started? 15 or something, 16 maybe, something like that. So that was the first time that war and the army and all that really took your attention, really took your notice, that when our country was involved in something. Well, not even then, because um, you know, I was working down in Wilson's Palm Tree National Park, and two of my brothers had been to Vietnam, but I never even thought about that much then. It was only because a friend of mine got killed in Vietnam and brought it home to me. And it never really brought home to me that they were actually killing Australians. Nothing to do with me, like, politically or anything. I, I just I just thought, you know, go and do something about that. It's your brother John and then Simon who go to war, and then yeah. you're next up. Do you volunteer? Do you volunteer through the National Servicemen Scheme, or do you go join the regular army? No, I, I volunteered for National Service when I was 19, but my mother had to sign a paper for me to do that, and she didn't want to sign it. So then I got indefinitely deferred. I didn't, my marble didn't come out of the barrel. But then they said, if you still want to, they sent me an no, if you still want to volunteer, rock on in. So well, I went. But I only did it through the National Service scheme, so that I only had to do two years instead of three, in case I didn't want it. I can appreciate your mother's hesitation there because you're the third of her children going off to this country, and she's probably seen at least John come home by this point, and I'm sure he was showing some signs of being affected by the conflict and didn't want that for the rest of her children. He did show some signs of <laughs> because I, I remember one time I wore an Australia badge that was off a military uniform and I, he went mad about me doing that because I wasn't in the army and everything else. At that point, before you've really put on the uniform, yet you've seen your older brother come home from conflict and be affected by it, did that concern you at all or you just didn't really give it much thought? No, it didn't concern me at all. I didn't. And in recruit training, they, um, they just they said, uh, what? 
to cause would you like to join? Not necessarily that you'll get your choice. So I just said, well, what's the quickest way to get there? And I said, volunteer for infantry. So that was my two choices. I hadn't given the brother a lot of thought at all about it. I just had to get there. So you felt this obligation to serve because of your friend. How was the training? How did that sort of waken you to the reality of military lifestyle? The military lifestyle was quite a shock. Quite a shock. Uh, in recruit training, <laughs> there's nothing like it. I didn't want to be an officer. All I wanted to do was get there. So then a few people thought that I, I had the wrong attitude toward the army. They said, well, their idea of that and mine I, uh, didn't bother me at all. The fact that my brothers had been there before me didn't bother me at all. I just let it get there. And it wasn't just because of a friend. It was because of Australians. It was my friend that got killed there. He bought it handed me that it's Australians are getting killed. So I just wanted to do something about it. Did you know much about the background of the conflict itself and have any opinions on that, or were you just motivated by this, my brothers are dying, my countrymen are dying over there, I need to do something about it? That was my only motivation, but at the time, but, you know, I learned a whole, I learned a bit more about their history and so on as time went on, and look, I think the Vietnamese themselves are a great race of people, I think, and they've, they've had a tough for years and years and years, but none of it concerned me at the time. So when did you get to Vietnam, 69, 70? 71. In the battalion, once we got over there, battalion strength, I was in the um, 10 platoon builder company, and we were always, always kept separate from the rest of the battalion. We were camped miles and miles away from the rest of the battalion. I don't know why it was, but delta company was always kept separate. And whereabouts was this? We knew it, Dad. They were down in the rubber near the airstrip, and we were on what they call Sass Hill. Okay, so you took over, the SAS had their own um, secluded area on the hill at Nui Dat, so you got to... Yeah, that gone, yeah. To me, it was good because when we were back in Nui Dat, which wasn't that often, and me, because we weren't with the, the rest of the battalion, you didn't have to walk around being careful who you saluted and who you didn't and all the rest of it, because we didn't have all the grass around us. So talk me through your average day in Vietnam, Andrew. Well, average day in Nui Dat or average day in the jungle. Mostly, well, I spent more time in the jungle than in Nui Dat. Let's do Nui Dat and then we'll get to the jungle. Nui Dat was um, when we were camp. We uh, had red real early before daylight, of course, for your stand too, just in case that's when you're going to get attacked at breakfast. And then you were ready, always ready to go at a moment's notice, always. So then uh, a lot of the time we had to use machetes just to cut grass to keep us busy. We did a lot of mundane, boring things that were supposed to just keep us busy. I remember one time there was a concert over there and we didn't get to go and see a temper team, never because we hadn't cut enough grass, so we were banned from going to the concert. <laughs> that's some um, excellent practice for unit morale. Yeah, yeah, that's right. But unit morale, well, yeah, look, out in the jungle, there was our third night in country, we lost two bugs, and one of them was a Dunnathroon trained officer, our boss. Was that your first contact experience? Yeah, it was, yeah. yeah it was only meant to be a training exercise, but anyway, we uh, we got our first kills and first killed on our third night there. Can you talk me through uh, that night a bit more, sort of the sequence of events and what role you played? We had our gunships coming in there with their miniguns blazing around our, our perimeter because we had, oh, I read the book somewhere, there's hundreds of them, and I can remember thinking that the tracer coming out of these mini guns, and it was like a fire hose of water. Now. Every fourth bullet was red tracer, but it looked like just solid red water coming out of these guns. They're magnificent, and the artillery and everything else. And I was that happy with all that because I knew we had artillery, we had choppers, and they didn't. But by the same token, you spend the craft and like wondering if you're going to see it tomorrow. They had green tracer, which was good because you could see which way some of their rounds were coming in from. Our officer that we lost, he'd stood up in a firefight and he got a machine gun across the belly, which blew all his ammunition and his forehand grenades blew up. I spent half the night covered in bits of him. And what you try to do is you try to melt into the ground. But anyway, daylight came. Good. Beauty. <laughs> Happy about that. Then get out of there. Yeah, we stayed there a while in that area, but then we just continued on with the operation. We then got our officer, Lieutenant John Wheeler, and he was replaced by a lieutenant who was fresh out of transport and did not have a clue about what he was doing. It wasn't his fault because he was out of transport. He wasn't trained up well enough to be a grunt in the jungle. So but that's where sergeants come in anyway. Thank God for sergeants. 
How did you feel at the time of that contact and the morning after? Oh, I remember the sergeant came over to me there the morning after and he said, there you go. Well, she's no good. I said, I want the next chopper out of here. I only came here to see the country, not to get shot at. <laughs> but I think he, he thought at first I was fair big on me. But anyway, it was, you just move on because it's just part of the job, you know. That's what it became to me anyway. I remember after that and the other odd thing. I remember saying to myself, I'm not going to remember any of this bad stuff. No, I'm only going to remember the good times. And, I, and actually, that's the way it worked for a long time. I, I remember that third night, of course, but that's the way it worked. There's, there's things that happen over there that I don't need to remember until we have a reunion or something and somebody will remind you of it. I would tell you the names of lots of bar girls. I couldn't tell you about, a lot about what we did at times because I just decided I wouldn't remember it. It worked for me. I imagine most of your contacts and encounters were in the thick of a jungle. Did you ever have any way you were closer to the enemy or had a better sight on them? Like, did you have a more intimate contact or was it all through the thick green? All through the thick green. There was one occasion where uh, one Viet Cong was about three feet from me and I never even saw him. He was on one side of a tree and I was on the other side. And he jumped down, heard him jump down into a dry riverbed and run. And so I thought, well, that one's not a threat. Where's his mate who is? So that's why I never even saw that one. I was looking for his mate. Do you remember your first kill? No, because you don't even know that you did because you're blazing on one of It was just about always in the dark and you just aimed at where you could see Tracer coming from or something like that. And next morning, you do a patrol out around, say, and there'd be drag marks, there'd be blood or whatever, but you didn't see. They, just, they took their bodies with them last time. So we never even got a body cam. We could never even be sure how many we got. Were you feeling prepared for all this or a bit deer in headlights at first? No, I think I was, I was feeling fairly prepared for all this. The training was just magnificent. It was just really good. But by today's standards, it might be different because you had that in you that what you're doing is killing vermin. You know, <laughs> that's how well trained you know, I was anyway. That, that's the way it was to me. I didn't regard these people as, as other humans. They were just vermin and needed killing. We'll come back to that. Let's talk about the conditions you were experiencing out there in the jungle, the humidity, the wet. Oh, the wet. I remember one time we got, um, we got fire, I mean, and uh, somebody had written to me in fountain pen, well, that was the end of that letter. You just, you got absolutely, totally used to the conditions. Absolutely, totally. The wet season, well, look, one time we were somewhere in the jungle and put you up for the night and I had to put my head up on my pack just so I wouldn't drown because it was only in water. You just got used to absolutely everything, just all part of it. And, you know, you were sweaty or whatever all the time and everything, but it didn't matter. You just got so used to it. And the food, Australian rations, they were good. American rations weren't because we couldn't carry enough of them. Everything in tins, tins of peaches and everything else, that took up too much room, but too heavy. New Zealand rations weren't any good because you needed water all the time and we didn't always have water because there was all dehydrated packs. You'd come across bomb craters full of crystal clear water but you couldn't use water and so you had to watch water and of course you had to shave every day or you'd get fizzed. We never understand that bit. They reckon it was a morale booster but anyway, there you go. How many days would you be out on patrol for on average? Well, the longest we did without coming back was six weeks, usually about four. In all the time you never ever took your boots off or anything. And you never have a change of clothes either? No, oh, no, no. I'll tell you a story about that. One time when uh, John Gordon went over to Vietnam, we were there then and we were coming into a fire support base and we thought, you rip it. New clothes, new boots, shower, hot food, and all my clothes on the front were I just stitched on green sandbags because my clothes were worn out because I was first through the scrub most of the time. My clothes were gone. So we came back in and then I walked around with sandbags and next thing I said, John Gordon's due to land here any minute. He can't see you people like that. Get resupplied and get back out the bush. So that was it. No hot meal, no nothing. Brilliant. What a great testament to how the Vietnam War has been handled at the political level. Well, yeah, like he wasn't allowed to see how it really was. Which is interesting because the anti-Vietnam War sentiment was very high by 1971. Yeah. Yet the army's still trying to protect itself from the politicians. Yeah, that's right. But now, you know, when, you, when you spoke to Don, did he tell you about the youngest brother, Michael, being a, he was a moratorium marcher and all of that? He was teaching anti-Vietnam. 
And so my answer to him was, that's great. It's terrific. It, this democracy we've got here allows you to do that, to go out and march against your government. It's fine. All you can do is remember who maintains your right to do it. Very true. As your year progresses, how's your attitude towards the war you're fighting? Is it changing? It didn't. After a while, I got that blase about it all. Yeah, I thought, well, if they get me, so what? It's only one more. It doesn't matter. But then we came back in to come home three weeks before we set sail back to Australia. But then we got called back out the bush again because uh, four, uh, got in four, the fourth battalion, they got all destroyed. So we went out back out to help them. And so I came back in out of the bush three days before I got on the ship to come home. Uh, once you're told you're going to come home, you think, oh, you beauty, I'm a bit more careful then. Because suddenly home's a possibility. Was that last patrol without incident? Yeah, 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 without incident. The one thing I remember about it was the only time in the whole time I ever saw napalm deployed and I thought, how awesome is that? I'm glad it's on our side and not theirs. They didn't have all the good stuff that we had, but they had home soil. And no rules of engagement? No, <laughs> but we didn't really either. We didn't. If we had free fire zones and something was there, you just blew it away. We were in a free fire zone one time and there was a, we came across a bit of a hut way over there. It was smoke coming out of the chimney, so we just called in and it blew it away because it shouldn't have been there. We never even went over to see what was in it. Did you maintain contact with home much while you were away? Yeah, I wasn't married or anything at the time, but I wrote to my parents and sent a couple of little dish, uh, one little weeny tape things. One of my brothers and then I wrote to her, yeah. Every time I was back in, I'd write. During this whole process, you're quite switched on and focused on the task at hand. You're not really uh, pining for home and you've really embraced the role of what why you're over there and are just set on doing the job. Absolutely. I was pretty lucky with that too because um, just before I turned 17, I'd left home anyway and was living on my own and stuff. And so I, could, I guess I just didn't need home as much. Did you ever spend much time with the local population when you went into villages and things like that? villages anyway we did and the only time we ever mixed with any local population would have been like down in long when you got your resting country but we didn't even get much of that i worked out there one time it was about one and a half days in down there every five six weeks or something average so you, because it was so sparse you would make the most of it when you were in vong and then before you had to get back to it oh yeah you wouldn't even go and get that drunk because all well, the beer in town for sale was all American beer and you just couldn't fit enough of it in you to get drunk on it. Too watered down? Yeah, I reckon. When we were back in nearly that, we were allowed to have two cans per man per day, perhaps. And that was it. And so you'd be out, say, six weeks, four weeks, whatever, without a beer or anything else. So. Besides that third night where you lost your platoon commander, were there any other particularly memorable contacts or engagements that you were a part of? We're getting a resupply because we're all out of food, out of ammunition, out of everything. We're getting a resupply and a helicopter hovering over us and it got shot down. And it landed on a couple of blokes and it just burned away to nothing. So I think that killed six people altogether, four in the chop and two on the ground. That, was, uh, that wasn't a very nice sort of a scene either. I remember going through a bunker season and I went along and had a look at you and I went down in one, put my head around the corner, couldn't see my hand in front of my face. So there am I in a firefight, bullets are going everywhere and I'm in this bunker and I thought, the minute I put my head up here to get out, I'm going to get shot by my own blokes. Oh, I shouldn't have jumped down that bunker. They'll think you're Viet Cong emerging, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but anyway, I got out and I remember I was hiding behind tank there at one stage because the tanks were with us. That was their first, that mob of tank is their first enemy contact since the Korean War. I hide me behind a tank and all the leaves on the tree beside me just suddenly all fell off, which looks really strange. It's just a thing in my mind that I remember. It just looked really strange. And then you hear the machine gun go that it caused them all to fall off. And one of the tanks I was hiding behind, it had a person in it, a friend of mine from hometown of Drew, and he was in the tank. But at the time, of course, I didn't know that. All the lights would been in there with him. There was another helicopter incident. It was a Chinook, you know, one of the real big, one, the big rotor at each end. Yep. We were in the fire support base in the jungle, a little rubber plantation thing, and the fire support base was moving out. So we were going to stay behind and ambush the scroungers that came in to go through the rubbish dump and whatever, because even just things and things they'd use to make booby traps and stuff. So the last helicopter out lifted off the ground beside the rubber, didn't lift high enough, went into the trees. We were lying in shells fractured like. I think 18 inches deep, just a little hole in the ground, a lengthier body that you'd say, get down 
below any fire. Well, he hit the rubber trees that hard that they all smashed down across me. I could hardly get out because people had camped there for so long. The dust was that thick we could hardly breathe. But one of the blokes in the helicopter fell out the back because they didn't burn our clothes properly. But he was only a few feet off the ground anyway. So he was OK. And then just the helicopter went wop, 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 making all these noises. The rotors are all damaged and landed again. And a bloke came over in American Air Force or something. And he had these two six guns on his side looking like the Lone Ranger, big silver bullets and everything else. Andrew, how did you find returning home? Uh, that was different. A lot of people I knew were uni students, so that was a bit different there. The girl I've been seeing off and on was uni. So anyway, so I just got sick of all those people because I was this, I was that, I was everything else that I wasn't. As far as I was concerned, I, didn't, I just left all that scene. And then the army kept sending me money, so I just sat up a tree and kept drinking. For a while, and then um, I went to visit my eldest brother on the back of Smash Bypass. He was working there, and he said, What are you going to do now? I said, I don't know. He said, There's a grader there, son. Why don't you buy that? And I said, Yeah, why don't you buy that? So I did. I didn't even know how to start the thing, but anyway, I bought it. And that's what I did for years after that. I hated graders and bulldozing and things. That was um, sort of, there was no problem for me. Like, I was just drifted a bit and dropped right, you know. And nothing really worried me that much at all back then. We talked earlier about how you had quite a channeled focus in the conflict and you knew what you were there to do, you felt prepared. Did that outlook at the time, you think, make your transition back home into civilian life, at least uh, mentally, quite straightforward? As far as I'm concerned, to move back into civilian life, it was just wasn't a problem to me. I'd done what I intended to do and that was just another phase and it was over and I just never had a problem at all, as far as I'm concerned, transitioning back. Made some really good mates that I still see and every now and again and, yeah, just not a problem for me. When you were in country, you saw the enemy just as non-humans that needed to be killed. That's it. How did that attitude change once you were back home and away from the war? Well, I guess it, it just wore off because back here, I just, they're all, they're all just good people here. It just wore off. So, yeah, I've never had the same feelings about Afghanistan or any of that or, Sometimes I wish, you know, that I could have gone to Afghanistan. But of course, that's all beyond me now, my age and everything. But yeah, sometimes I wish I could be there just doing my bit. But it just you know, sort of, none of those feelings occur to me anymore. You feel this patriotic call to serve alongside your fellow Aussies. You can mentally switch on to do the task. And you look at other conflicts and still have those feelings that you wish you could be doing your part for helping your countrymen it's not so much because you don't feel motivated by necessarily the cause of the conflict but you see fellow Aussies out there and you want to help them on the line that's it no, nothing political no 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 here's the thing I'm just a simple bloke I'm pretty simple do you march on Anzac Day these days yep every Anzac Day I didn't for a long time but do now we used to get out of bed at some ungodly hour and get down to the shrine and do the dawn service and so on and um, take my sons with me are you proud to have served? Certainly am. How do you look back on your time in Vietnam today? Wouldn't miss it for quids. I'm glad I did it. I wouldn't want my sons to do what I did, but I'm glad I did. Well, Andrew, thank you for your service. We are grateful, and thank you for speaking with me today. No worries at all, Alex. That was my conversation with Andrew Wells. Be sure to go back and listen to the earlier episode with John, if you haven't already heard it. Look us up online at www.lifeonthelinepodcast.com. We're also on Facebook at Life on the Line Podcast, on Twitter at L-O-T-L Pod, and on Instagram at Life on the Line Podcast. You can also email us at podcast at lifeonthelinepodcast.com. And don't forget to rate us five stars in your podcast app. Life on the Line is brought to you by Thistle Productions, artwork by Big Cat Design, music by Dan Van Werkhoven. Thanks for listening. And lest we forget, 